All right. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Adrienne Griffin. I am the Senior Director of Public Health and Leadership for the Association of University Centers on Disabilities. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to a joint meeting of our Emergency Preparedness Special Interest Group and our Health and Disability Special Interest Group. Today's session is a pre-conference for our annual meeting, and it's a little bit different than our other pre-conferences because we are featuring a panel that we're calling a fireside chat with leaders in health, disability, and emergency preparedness. If you are not too zoomed out, we would love to see you on camera, but we also know that you might need a break from the visual stimulation. So it's up to you whether or not you have your cameras on. We would love to know that you're here. If you wouldn't mind just popping into the chat a quick hello with your name and where you're from, that would be wonderful. I'm just going to go over a couple logistics so that you're familiar with how the session will flow today. And I'm going to make sure folks are on mute. You can mute yourself. Please make sure folks are on mute. All right, I'm just looking to see. Okay, well Sorry about that. And that's just a reminder for everybody, make sure that you're on mute. Um, you do have, we will have question and answers at the end, so you will have the ability to mute and unmute yourself. So that is a good reminder. And that kicks off into my um, logistics. Uh, just really wanted to go over today how this session will flow. We have a number of wonderful panelists that I will introduce in just a few moments. Today's session is um, recorded so that if you would like to go back and view it later or share it with a colleague, you are definitely welcome to do so. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, when you are participating um, that you are thinking about questions for the panelists. We'll have a dedicated question and answer time at the end, um, but feel free to use the chat function throughout to uh, pose a question that you may have so that we have a robust question and answer time at the end. And I apologize, I'm getting a little bit of an echo on my end. I don't know if that's from other speakers or am I still coming through okay? All right, thank you. Um, we are going to have uh, a bit of a welcome from our leaders and liaisons for the two host uh, special interest groups first, and then we will have an interactive conversation with the panel, really reflecting on the space that we're in right now with COVID and the response to that, as well as thinking through how this is a time to be creative and flexible and adaptive. There is no one size fits all approach for any of this. So we'll, we'll have that in mind throughout our discussion today. We have a wonderful roster of panelists that I'd like to introduce. And really, I'm just gonna give the quick highlights of the hats that you wear and um, not get into too many um, specifics on your bios uh, as those are um, on our main conference website. Um, and I want to preserve time for our, our uh, interactive discussions today. We're going to hear from Ilka Riddle, who is the chair of AECD's Health and Disability Special Interest Group. She's also the associate professor at um, the University of Cincinnati and as the director of the USED there. The USED is the Center of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, and that's housed at Cincinnati's Children's Hospital. So welcome, Ilka. We'll also hear from Laura Stahl, who is the chair of AUCD's Emergency Preparedness Special Interest Group. Laura is a professor of educational psychology and the assistant director at that you said, the Center on Disability and Development at Texas A&M University. So welcome, Laura. We'll also hear from Justine Shorter, or Justice as she goes by. Uh, she is with, she is a disaster protection advisor with the National Disability Rights Network. Welcome, Justice. It's great to have you back. I believe you were a panelist for us a couple years ago, so it's nice to have you again. And next we'll hear from Aaron, um, is it, I'm sorry, Aaron Signorale, is that at all correct? <laughs> if you wanted to jump in, <laughs> uh, correct me. 
that would be fine. Um, and Aaron is uh, an emergency preparedness specialist who sits in the Department of Public Health in Monroe County, which is in right Rochester. Now, I think we're almost being um, irresponsible to. And I'm sorry, uh, someone else this. needs to make um, sure that they're on know, mute. We, we really do need to. Thank you. You do have the ability to mute and unmute yourself because we are going to do questions and answers at the end. So thanks. Um, next up, we'll hear from Scott Greason, who is the Deputy Emergency Management Coordinator in the city of Richardson, which is in Texas, and he sits in their Office of Emergency Management. So welcome, Scott. And then wrapping up our panel will be uh, Vincent Siasoko, and Vincent wears a number of hats. He's the Assistant Professor in the Department of Family and Social Medicine and in the Department of Pediatrics at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He's also the Director of Primary Care at the Rose F. Kennedy Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center at the Montefiore Medical Center, which is affiliated with the University Hospital for the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. So that is who is with you. You're in good company. And without further ado, I'm going to uh, just move us along here and uh, turn it over to you, Ilka, for a few words of welcome. Thank you so much, Adrian. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome for me um, from a cold um, Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, we are really excited about this pre-conference session and um, we are also excited to partner with the Emergency Preparedness Special Interest Group. Um, as Adrian mentioned, um, I have been the chair of the Health and Disability Special Interest Group at AUCD for a long time and we cover a very broad spectrum of health-related issues um, at, in our special interest group. And so um, today, we will really focus on health, healthcare in kind of like the um, kind of emergency preparedness, planning, um, response kind of um, uh, sector. And um, yes, um, so welcome everyone. Um, we will have a, what we call a fireside chat. Um, so um, Adrian will ask us some questions that we will respond to. We will have a little discussion as a panel, and then certainly um, we will open it up for questions from you, sure. and we want to hear from you about your ideas, your experiences, and certainly also your questions. Um, so with that, I would like to give it over to Laura Stau, if she is able to um, talk at the moment. I know there was a little emergency, um, so we'll see if Laura is on. Um, if not, I will... Um, um, give it back to Adrian. Thanks so much, um, Ilka. Yes, it's so funny when you do research and presentations on, on emergency management, and then you have an emergency right before you present. But um, I think we've, we've got it in, in hand now. So um, welcome, everybody. And uh, again, I'm, I'm Laura Stow. I lead Project RED Research and Education on Disability and Disaster here um, at our center at Texas A&M University. Um, and um, as Adrian said, I also chair the emergency preparedness mm -hmm. SIG for um, AUCD. Um, in most states right now, um, emergency management is working hand in hand with public health in response to COVID-19. Um, in fact, um, in some states, including my own um, emergency management, in fact, um, shares that status as lead agency for response to the pandemic. Um, so our emergency preparedness special interest group um, as part of AUCD is more important than ever. And we'd love for you to join us. Um, you can just look on the AUCD website under the issues tabs to uh, join our SIG um, uh, listserv. So I'm uh, very interested in hearing uh, more from, from our panelists today. And thank you all for joining us uh, this uh, afternoon or, or morning, depending where you are in your time zone. Great, thanks, Laura, appreciate you. And I uh, hope you stay safe where you are. All right. So. 
next, we wanted to have a bit of a conversation with the panelists, really thinking about how this is a highly adaptive time, right? There is no one size fits all for anything we're dealing with now. Um, we asked each of the panelists to just share a short reflection on perhaps a good idea or a silver lining in all of this and um, share that um, as a way to kick us off. So it's a bit of a warm up to a, a deeper conversation. Um, and first up, I have um, Ilka. I actually have your slide up first for your reflections if you wanted to kick us off. Absolutely, I would be happy to, Adrian. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as you can see, my slide has a little cartoon on it, and I will actually come back to this cartoon in a little while when we talk more about um, some kind of great ideas or different ideas that we have had. Um, so Adrian had asked us to start out with thinking about like silver linings and um, I think sometimes it's hard to think about silver linings when you're in the middle of a crisis or a pandemic and to see it as a silver lining. Um, but coming from a disability perspective, I think there are a few things I want to just highlight that I think have maybe helped us or can help us really in the future. Um, and so that is kind of like where I look at it in terms of a silver lining, fully understanding that right now it might not necessarily look that way. So one of the areas that I think we have made great improvements um, is in telehealth. I think um, the response from um, hospitals and um, healthcare providers uh, regarding on how can we still uh, provide good quality care um, to our patients without putting them at risk, I think um, is something that um, has moved very quickly. Um, we also had um, health insurance companies move on that very quickly in terms of coverage of telehealth services. So some things were possible that I don't know if they would have moved that quickly without this pandemic. And I think there are some definite benefits for people with disabilities in terms of having access to telehealth, which certainly isn't without challenges, but that's my silver lining, one of them. Um, I think the other one that I would say is awareness and focus a little bit more on, um, I think specifically adults with disabilities, especially adults living in um, congregate care setting and the challenges and the risks. So you know that as a network overall, we are very concerned always about people living in congregate setting because they come with some challenges. And we have clearly seen this with a pandemic, um, how quickly something can spread um, in congregate settings and that they may not be the best way to keep people healthy. And so having that spot spotlight on that um, would be the silver li lining, most certainly not that people get sick or that people die um, in those um, settings. And then I think um, the spotlight on the rights that people with disabilities have, again, challenging because we talk about care rationing, medical equipment rationing, but I think what that also has brought to light is um, great advocacy around the rights of people with disabilities and um, that people with disabilities have protection and should have those protections. And um, we also have seen the court system and the Department of Justice actually stepping up and um, making it very clear that um, we cannot rationing based on a disability um, and that's um, hospitals who have uh, tried that, um, that that is um, not legally appropriate. So I think for me, those are some silver linings. Again, awareness about the rights, being able to um, share um, people's right with people with disabilities and their family members in having access to telehealth would be some of the silver linings that I see coming from this pandemic. Thank you, Adrian. All right. Well, thanks, Ilka. Appreciate you sharing that. And we'll come back to the slide uh, in a bit uh, for Ilka's other remarks as we keep going on the panel. All right. So next, uh, I had uh, Laura, if you are able to talk, I know that you also were dealing with a, a bit of an emergency at home. If you are able to talk, I have you uh, have your slides up. But if you're not, we can also keep going. Yeah, we're, we're ready to go. We're good here. All right. So 
All right. So um, do you have the, the, the next slide? I do. I do. do. Okay. So what, what I wanted to share with you here on this slide is just a sampling of the many hazards that occur here in our state of Texas. We have flooding, we have hail storms, we have tornadoes, we have hurricanes, we have wildfires. And as a matter of fact, NOAA, the, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, estimates that Texas has experienced over 100 separate um, billion dollar disasters. And in the 40 years leading up to 2019, that was um, included over $250 billion in damages. So a wide diversity of different kinds of hazards um, um, that, that um, are very challenging and um, damaging. And then here we come in 2020 with uh, COVID-19. COVID um, so a silver lining, if you want to call it this, is that um, Texas emergency management is very experienced in dealing with different kinds of hazards, whether they be um, natural hazards um, such as, as storms or natural hazards such as the very small uh, COVID virus um, that's causing this pandemic. Um, and yet the multiplicity of these different kinds of hazards make it really challenging um, and calls for the need for varied expertise and different disciplines to address um, these kinds of hazards. So um, one way that, that we're moving forward um, in the context of COVID-19 is that um, our center is leading one of the working uh, groups for public health and social sciences research um, sponsored by the University um, of Colorado at the Natural Hazard Center. And um, together with a group of, of 14 scholars from nine universities and centers, our work group is, um, uh, uh, has formed a think tank on emerging research and issues regarding COVID-19 and disabilities. And um, together we are developing a series of papers around these, these issues. And that's being informed by the interdisciplinary approaches of, of these scholars. And so we see great promise in continuing our work together over the next year um, in taking this kind of interdisciplinary approach to uh, addressing this, this very sticky problem of COVID-19. Thanks, Laura. Appreciate that framing. Uh, next up, wanted to turn the virtual microphone over to you, uh, Justice, if you wanted to take the microphone and, and share just a couple thoughts around what might be a, a silver lining or, you know, a good idea that has emerged out of all of this. Hey there, this is Justice. Yes, I, I actually um, took a few moments when um, I initially heard this idea of a fireside chat. I said, hmm, I wonder what my reflections will be on the day of, <laughs> because they are changing so rapidly every single day. And that's perhaps why I didn't um, put everything together in one singular slide. But I will just share a couple of things that are on my mind and on my heart today. Um, in terms of a silver lining, I think that I have really been inspired and excited um, by how people are now starting to see the connection between racial justice and disability justice. So we tend to say that um, you can't have racial justice without disability justice and you cannot have disability justice without racial justice. And I think that has emerged out of these concurrent crises happening right now in terms of the coronavirus pandemic as well as the crisis of police brutality. And I think it's really been interesting to see those two worlds merge in ways that they were previously unwilling to do prior to uh, 2020 and, and some of the uprisings and the things that we've noticed. I want to acknowledge that people are now absorbing how disability justice really picks up where disability rights leaves off. And so um, these two uh, 
phrases are typically used interchangeably and they're, they're not the same. But if you are curious about disability justice, you can go ahead and check out SINS and Valid's website. They have a framework that they've coined around disability justice, which includes 10 principles that they've created. Um, and that is really the baseline that many of us who do disability justice work and even folks who do disability rights work um, has come or have come to reference uh, in terms of, of how to really guide and shape the work that's being done. Among those 10 principles, though, is that is a central principle called uh, leadership by the most impacted. It's principle number two. And I think about that when I consider what has been done by way of emergency management and how people have managed to save themselves and care for their communities and their families throughout um, this year and also throughout, you know, decades and, and, and throughout our history uh, more collectively. But I think about mutual aid um, systems and practices that have been put in place, right? Communities just caring for one another, putting together uh, grocery drop-offs, just filling in the gaps um, that have not been met by other programs and services and how those have really been absolutely central to the survival um, of individuals with disabilities. When I think about um, different ways to solve the problem, of course, I think about, you know, mutual aid, I think about additional funding being funneled to the people who are actually doing the work on the ground and that, of course, being inclusive and centering um, people with disabilities and uh, organizations who center individuals with disabilities and those folks who are out there doing this work on the ground. Um, but I also think about um, a couple of other silver linings at uh, the first speaker. I'm very, very thrilled to, to hear that she mentioned um, some of those legal remedies that took place, right? So I think about a lot of the legal action that was taken by the Protection and Advocacy Network. Um, many of those victories, a lot of the, the shifts in tone and in language that we see coming out of the Department of Health um, and also a lot of state specific departments of health um, have come by way of complaints that have been filed by not only protection and advocacy agencies, but also many other uh, partner organizations who have been a part of that process. And I wanna emphasize that because it really focuses on the sheer importance of collaboration um, and working together with one another uh, to kind of bring forth some substantive change. So that happened in terms of the crisis standards of care. You also see it um, happening uh, now um, in terms of that distribution plans and how those are starting to unfold. And as we think about those, I'm thinking about people with disabilities who are in all forms of congregate care, congregate care or who are in carceral uh, setting. So I'm not just thinking about um, people in nursing homes, but I'm also thinking about the folks who are in uh, group homes, both licensed and unlicensed. I'm thinking about folks in psychiatric facilities. What does this mean for youth detention centers, jails, prisons? Um, are we having those conversations because people with disabilities and kids and young people with disabilities are in all of those settings as well? So it's not about changing your lanes. This is the things that I, I commonly say. It's not about changing your lane. It is about widening your lane. You have a competency, you have an expertise, you have a history or a skill set and disability. Can we um, observe and absorb and practice that in, in all ways, especially as it relates to the multiple uh, communities or identities that people with disabilities live within? So I'm really curious curious um, to think about that. So I think about it in terms of civil unrest, and that was a concern a couple of weeks ago. Um, it may still or may not be that concern, but I, it, the purpose of preparedness is to simply put things in place so that you um, kind of have a framework for how you can think about how uh, particular populations will be impacted. So we were thinking about that. And I was also thinking about how will folks who are transgender be impacted, because there are transgender folks with disabilities who are impacted by um, disasters and crises in this pandemic. What does that mean for vaccine distribution plans that, you know, if there's ID requirements, will people who are transgender with disabilities have to deal with, with more stringent practices that make it difficult or challenge their capacity to participate in, in certain emergency programs. Uh, I'm reading up and having conversations with Black liberation movements um, um, and trying to figure out what the course of action is there um, because there are Black people with disabilities. I want to know about undocumented folks because there are undocumented folks with disabilities and I want to know what that means in relation to, to the work that I'm doing. Obviously, we should care about these community irrespective of, of what whether or not, um, you know, the, the disability does not have to be the primary necessity as to whether or not we care about these communities surely. And I can say that as someone who identifies as a black, blind, lesbian woman, I deeply care about these communities. 
Um, but in terms of me going back to what I said before about you not entirely switching your lane and feeling like you have to be an expert in immigration or you have to be an expert in, in, in Black issues, um, you can, however, um, share uh, your expertise and your knowledge related to disability if that is a particular competency that you have and you can understand it through the prism of all of these other groups and have that strength in your advocacy and strength in the work that you do. I'm going to stop there, Adrian, and toss it back over to you. Thanks, Justice. Appreciate that. I want to come back to you later and ask uh, thoughts around how do you widen that lane? <laughs> yeah, and I see that Brian uh, Russell from Florida chimed in and said widening the lane is vital to our success. So that point resonated with others too. Thanks, Justice, for being here. Um, next up, we'd love to turn the virtual podium over to you, Aaron. And I know you had a, a summary slide on what might be a, a silver lining or positive in all of this. So I'll turn it over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Adrian. So uh, I work in emergency preparedness for Monroe County Public Health, and I have a program that is called Accessible Preparedness. It's the whole uh, motto of it is that it's not a one size fits all approach to preparedness. And I was lucky enough that uh, the silver lining is we kind of completed a lot of the first year, year and a half of this program and reached out to a lot of people with disabilities in different situations and different uh, economic groups, different races, different everything across the board because it's not a one size fits all approach. And, and we brought them in to do pre emergency preparedness training through a six session course. And this was right before COVID. We, we did this, you know, for the uh, half the year in 2018, half the year of 2019. And then towards the end of 2019, we finished up that first cycle. And I started doing interviews and videos with some of the students in the class a few months later, asking them how they've integrated that training into their lives. And some of them, you know, hey, th this is really honest. They said, you know what, I, I took the class, I thought about it, but I actually didn't do anything yet. And I just, I haven't actually, you know, started preparing for having extra food or having extra supplies or medications. But now that I talked to them and had that interview process with them, they, they started. And it, I've talked with a few of them and touched base throughout COVID-19. And the silver lining is that a lot of people from my class are doing a lot better through this emergency just in the short time from learning the basics of emergency preparedness. They were able to have food on hand for, for that, you know, 14 day quarantine period. They had already started reaching out and building that network of people that they can, uh, they can call upon to help in times of need. So they already had, when, when people started to contact trace with them, they're like, yep, I have these three people that can get me food, uh, everything I need. I already talked with my doctor six months ago to see if, if I could get an extra week advance on some of my medications. And some of them, I know that's one of the really hard topics, but some of them were actually able to get the doctor to buy into that and say, okay, you can have up to you know six or seven days worth of kind of like an emergency supply of your medication. So in case there's a backlog in being able to get you med medication, COVID-19 really, really inundated all the logistics aspects of getting people medical supplies, uh, obviously like food and everything, even just trying to get your Amazon gifts or whatever you're getting, all of that was slowed down. So someone with a specific disability that they need this equipment, they need these medications to live, that's that's a really scary time. So this uh, doing this project just before COVID-19 ended up just happening to work really well in the fact that a lot of these people were able to not be impacted as much with when COVID-19 struck. And then there's also another kind of good idea that came from this. Anytime I taught this class, I always kind of started off saying, you know what, even though I'm teaching the class, I'm not the subject matter expert on your disability. 
you're that subject matter expert and you're going to teach me just as much, if not more than I'm going to teach you. I'm really a facilitator to help these amazing ideas come, come across in the group so that we can help each other. And I really learned so much about, about interpreting services, about different people's needs and disabilities, and really trying to advocate more and more in emergency management and public health to make sure that the message is inclusive of the population in our area. In Rochester, New York, in Monroe County, we have a huge population in the deaf community. We have a National Technical Institute for the Deaf at RIT. And that it kind of came up when we started doing contact tracing. We, a few people on my team were saying, well, how are we gonna get this communication out? And we already had interpreters for all the emergency broadcasts, which was not a thing that we had going on in the past. So that's a huge, huge benefit right there. And then uh, when we started to look at getting a interpreting service for contact tracing, we, a few people from my team said, you know what, why are we getting interpreters for such a huge portion of our community when we can reach out to that community and train them to be contact tracers so that they can have that direct connection instead of going through an interpreting service. And that idea has blossomed into having a few uh, deaf contact tracers that we trained through an interpreter. And now they're able to just jump on a video call with people that have been exposed to COVID-19 and really have a conversation with them really, you know, show them that you're having uh, that conversation through the means that communicate the best to you. And I think that was really important. And people have become uh, more receptive in the community to being able to say, here's my contact, here's this, here's that, and really understanding some more of the education because we have contact tracers that can just directly talk with them. And we've done the same thing with some Spanish speaking uh, contact tracers. And we've, we've looked and canvassed for specific different groups where we can have somebody that can actually speak that language instead of going through an interpreting service. So I think that that's one thing that just really came out of uh, COVID-19 and really tied in the accessible preparedness project, that I think has really set us off in a good direction. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that. And uh, you got some nice love in the chat. Just wanted to give, give you a chance to absorb that. Um, some folks are really appreciative of your adaptive thinking and the um, statement that you made. I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something along the lines about being prepared to serve people with disabilities helps you be ready to serve the whole community. So um, thank you for your remarks. Appreciate you. And we'll hear from you in just a little bit in a deeper way. All right, next, I uh, want to turn the virtual podium over to you, Scott, to share your thoughts on uh, what might be a positive or a silver lining in all of this. It's such a such a hard thing to say silver lining and it's such a tragedy. But with all particular disasters, we're able to get some valuable lessons learned. Um, items that we had in place, we, you know, in Richardson, we're a small jurisdiction, probably a population of about 150,000. But we have a unique location within Texas that our surrounding areas are very heavy populated uh, with the city of Dallas and other cities with a population of 100,000. Um, some of our things that we 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 wanted to, we were always curious about, right? And you can collaborate more than anything. We had preparedness um, out there. We, we always hang our hat on the preparedness and we call it empowerment. We want to empower people. Um, and we really want to empower the people that need it most, which are those with disabilities, functional or service needs more than anything. Um, sometimes, and I know Aaron just talked about uh, uh, the deaf. We have, uh, a large deaf community in our area as well. And speaking with somebody from that was leading one of those associations there, she really wanted to stress the empowerment um, because there was a misnomer that, and, and I think that's just not with the disability, but with most folks that when 
things happen that the state or the feds will rush in and be there to help you with everything. And that might be true to an extent, it might take a couple of days, of course, but there's things that they could do themselves to prepare for themselves. And so the preparedness, you know, having those particular things handy for at least seven days really panned out. Um, and people were able to see the value of that empowerment that we've gone through. The other thing was the collaboration. And I think Justice talked about this collaboration. I was shaking my hand vigorously because the collaboration was absolutely key for us. Um, we had so much information coming in in such a short time, right? So much information, conflicting information. Uh, and God bless these long-term care facilities and these other caregivers having to try to, you know, to, to assimilate this information that's coming through them. It's almost like drinking from a fire hose. So what we were able to do within Richardson was bring together emergency management, our public health, and our fire department that runs our EMS program and key, uh, create a committee that would work with these long-term care facilities when we got notices that they had positives to kind of help take the scariness out of it, right? Provide some information. Hey, this is what's expected of you. These are the resources that we can provide. Um, one of the things that Texas did is they, and I think it was a good idea to a point, but... Uh, and I'm sure Laura can tell you this as well, they pushed out what we call a, a STAR, State of Texas Assistance Request. Well, these folks had never filled that out in their life. And there was so much information coming out of them. We took it internally. It's like, how can we break this down to them and enforce this partnership that we have? Uh, in Richardson, we have a caregiver uh, association. We work with these long-term care facilities to review plans, give them ideas on things to think about. We uh, try to train and exercise, but even exercises, Nothing beats a real live operation to, to build those bonds. We were able to build these particular bonds. We were able to go into these long-term care facilities and break the information down, get an idea of what they were working with, and then give them plenty of resources to kind of help them get through this particular issue. Uh, one of the things that we did in North Texas, and it kind of spread through the state, was create task force for testing to be able to quickly go into these long-term care facilities and test individuals. And not just test, but then come back and sanitize and then give them real life lessons that they could utilize very quickly, not very complicated, to maintain this, that uh, sanitization there and, and hopefully uh, limit the spread. Um, those bonds have been great. The collaboration has been absolutely wonderful. Not, and it's reached out. We had a healthy amount of caregivers and long-term care facilities within our community. I would easily say that it's doubled now. Um, and it's, it's just really been a blessing. The other thing we had is we were able to, to put other operations in place. Um, unfortunately, we had Hurricane Laura, which was unique because now the typical use of the congregate shelters uh, had to be pushed to the side. We couldn't do that. What we found, and uh, actually uh, to a relief, is that the non-congregate shelters worked a lot better than our congregate did. It, it empowered people. They had their privacy, and they were able to recover quicker, believe it or not. We still had the issues where people came in needing special equipment, the medical equipment, what have you, and we were able to get that. One of the things in our planning is we had a healthy list of medical equipment, special needs equipment, and where some other people were maybe not finding that equipment because maybe they only had one or two or three providers on the list. We had a healthy list. Some of them we had to go out of state to get, but we, the point was we were able to get it. We were even able to reach and help um, an individual that reached out to our mayor. Um, Laura's... Uh, leads the Texas Disability Task Force. Uh, we got roadblocked. It was one time that we actually could not find equipment. And talking about collaboration, through that particular group, I was able to address this lady's needs. She had a son that was needing breathing equipment. And uh, he talking about they were, the medical providers were putting limits on uh, uh, as far as supplies and what have you. Now that's exactly what happened uh, with this young lady. So I was able to reach out to Laura. She was able to spread it through the group amazing, absolutely amazing. People were able to reach out to her and we were able to get that problem solved. But it's that collaboration, right? I mean, it was just wonderful, not only with them, but also with our nonprofits. There's so many things that we were able to accomplish through this um, and still accomplishing through the COVID. Uh, and I think it's really going to set the template to move things forward. Do we have problems? Most definitely. I think some of them were some with our state facilities, limiting information that was coming out. Um, but far and I would just say that uh, for the most part, it was a huge success, at least in Richard, in Richardson. Great. Well, thanks, Scott. Appreciate you, you sharing those remarks and reflections with us. Um, next, I want to 
turn the virtual podium over to you, Vincent. I'd love to um, pull up your slide here. I know that you said you had a couple uh, positives or silver linings in, in all of this. Let me just go back to your slide. All right, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so just to give you a quick background on myself, so I'm a family physician here in New York City. I uh, also worked in the urgent care world for several years. Um, in addition to my role at the Kennedy Youth Center, I'm also the chief medical officer of the Symmetric Community Health Centers, which is a network of community health centers throughout New York City that provides services for intellectual, patients with intellectual and mental disabilities. So, we provide services for about close to 6,500 individuals throughout the area and provide services to those individuals living in probably about 30 to 40 homeless disability agencies um, throughout New York City. Um, on a larger scale, um, throughout New York State, I'm sure Aaron knows this, um, you know, we talked about previous uh, speakers about coalitions and collaborations. I mean, that, that is just so key. Here in New York, um, across New York State, there are about seven major development disability uh, coalitions. Um, they provide services to close to 250,000 individuals across New York State. Uh, they represent about 300 plus different disability agencies from, from the Bronx to Niagara Falls to Buffalo. Um, the New York Disability Advocates, you can see the, the logo there, is their advocacy arm. Um, so I think some of the silver linings in, in you know, Talking from uh, the Bronx in New York City, we were at the epicenter of the epicenter. We, uh, we were the ones really hit the hardest and the quickest. And uh, it was overwhelming for sure. But what was really wonderful were the coalitions um, because we were all there for support. Um, um, Interagency Council, several palsy uh, associations, that's just one of the uh, two of the seven. What was happening was there wasn't. It, the information was just coming so fast and furious, and it really wasn't, it was really sure what to believe, what not to believe. How do you take care of somebody in your group home? Now they got to be quarantined, they got to be isolated. Um, you know, here in New York City, um, they closed down the New York City public school system on March 16th, which was the largest in the nation. And then on March 17th, OPWDD closed down every day program. Now, our health centers take care of our DD population. So each of our health centers are connected to day programs. So come March 17th, we were a ghost town and we were totally cut off from our individuals. So these DD coalitions um, were our, our connection to those individuals we took care of in the concrete setting and those that lived in the community. Um, so we were all sharing information. So these DD coalitions would maybe have anywhere from maybe 10 to 15 committee members at a time, meet once a month. There were over a hundred people on the Zoom meeting, and everybody was just so helpful sharing information. I think one of the things that came out of New York was the data that shared, um, you know, that was shared among the different uh, development disability agencies. Information on the conference settings, on the individuals, um, deaths, not only individuals but also staff. Um, so that data was really key uh, to bring that to the advocacy level to make the state aware of the needs of our, our patient population, um, not only of the individuals, but also the DSPs, also the staff that were in uh, working in the group home. I mean, those are our frontline heroes. So I think the data that we shared, um, and some of you probably know, I mean, that contributed to a couple of articles in the New York Times. Um, uh, there was a couple of uh, research uh, reports that came out of Syracuse University that shed light on the need uh, for our care for our patient population, PPEs for our DSPs and staff. So I think uh, coalitions, collaborations, communication is so key. Um, that's a common understanding. I mean, that's just kind of a no-brainer. But what came out of it was sharing data and the ability to raise awareness and improve upon advocacy and being asked to, to come to the table and talk about um, your patient population. You know, um, I think here in you know New York City, in New York State, unfortunately, a lot of the nursing homes got hit. The assisted living facilities got hit, you know, and the spotlight was on them, uh, rightfully so, but there still wasn't enough spotlight on a concrete setting. Um, so that's one of the silver linings. The other silver lining is the electronic interdisciplinary connectivity. Telehealth is the way of the world now. It's, uh, it was a lifesaver. Um, you know, and I, I think the state and the Fed regulations 
uh, because of COVID. And, and I, forget, I apologize, I know the speaker said this before, um, but if COVID never hit. So we've always wanted to provide telehealth. Uh, my clinics are in, in urban areas. We're in the South Bronx, we're in Flatbush, Brooklyn. So based on regulations, we can provide telehealth, but we won't get reimbursed. So that's a big challenge. So that was one of our big barriers to providing that. When COVID hit, the regulations eased up. We were able to provide that. Um, one of the things that we unfortunately had to make decisions on our health centers and was to close certain sites and furlough staff. We furloughed close to 50% of our staff. It, it was very difficult. So the ability to provide telehealth, provide the quality of care, see our individuals, make sure that we can pay our bills, keep people employed and working uh, was key. Uh, so yeah, tell them, you know, it, it was a real godsend. It, it's not the be all end all. Um, I think one of the challenges, of course, is, you know, what can you do with telehealth and what can you do on site? Telehealth shouldn't take the place of a face-to-face of -a -face visit in some situations. Um, so I think that's a learning process that's going to be for all providers. Um, but I think telehealth is just, uh, it was just a real uh, blessing. So I think it was helpful, especially, especially when we talk about behavioral health issues and mental health issues that came out of it. Um, you know, our psychiatrists and, and clinicians, uh, psychologists, social workers are almost 100% telehealth and were able to maintain that connectivity um, for behavioral health and mental health and, and stress and, and anxiety. I think that's really important. Here in New York, we have what's called the Regional Health Information Organization. Um, I'm not sure if they have it in other uh, states, but the this concept has been around for several years now, and the idea was to have hospitals and practices and clinics all speak to each other, quote unquote, um, and share data. Um, unfortunately, it's not a perfect science, but probably about a year before COVID hit, uh, we connected with our, our RIO, our HIO in New York City, and we were able to work with another platform called Azara, and we were able to put together a report that see any of our patients that were hospitalized at any hospital in New York City, we could get their name, their date of birth, which hospital they were seen at, when they were discharged and the date, which patient um, had or didn't have a call visit with one of our, our providers. This is prior to COVID. This was so crucial when COVID hit because again, we were cut off. However, we were able to utilize this report because we were it was still running. So uh, my office is based in the Bronx, so we were all bunkered down in the South Bronx, but through this Rio Regional Health Information Organization and this weekly report, we were able to see, okay, we have two patients from a group home on Staten Island that just get discharged, let's get set up for a telehealth visit. Somebody just got hospitalized a month before they got discharged, let's set up another telehealth health visit. So I think the silver lining with electronic interdisciplinary connectivity um, was uh, was definitely a silver lining uh, and uh, uh, a great blessing for patients and, and for us to make sure that we can continue providing care uh, as physicians and clinicians. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you, Vincent. I really appreciate it. Your um, points around connectivity for um, staying in touch with um, those who have co occurring conditions and dealing with all of the pieces of telehealth around that and echoing the points around coalitions and connectivity in that way too. Thank you. And um, that was a great way to um, wrap up that first chunk of conversation with the panel, but that was really just a little bit of a warm up. <laughs> we are gonna go a level deeper now and talk about how we want things to be different, right? What do we want to change? Uh, how, you know, how can we be creative and problem, problem solving and addressing these challenges that we've all just mentioned? Um, so I'm going to throw that question out to the panel. And um, I know uh, a couple of you had some specific thoughts around that. Um, I want to just circle back to, to you, Ilka, to see if you want to kick us off. And I know that you wanted to uh, perhaps use your other slide. So I will all circle back to that if you wanted to kick us off. Sure. 
Thank you, Adrian. I think it was really so interesting and um, to hear from so many about the amazing work that has happened. I think um, if I kick this off in terms of like, what would I like to see change or what should be different? Um, I think one of the things that we have seen and that might not be um, that great is that there's a lot of attention um, surrounding an issue during um, kind of like the crisis and maybe right after the crisis. And then there are all kinds of plans that people are talking talk about in terms of like, oh, we need to put this in place. We need to not forget about this when this is all over and we need to address it. And then time moves on and all the things that we've talked about in terms of not wanting to forget are forgotten because the crisis, the pandemic, the you know, storm is over and we are back to our normal lives. And I think we have to really try to continue our collaborations to continue to really think about, okay, so let's not get back into this kind of pandemic situation ever again. So how can we make sure that we prepare better and that we prepare um, appropriately for people with disabilities um, and other marginalized groups and how can we get that into writing and not just into writing um, in a protocol or a guide that sits on somebody's um, shelf or desk that may or may not even be pulled out at the next crisis, um, but how can we really integrate that into our thinking, frameworks, practice, um, so that it just becomes part of standard practice, part of um, standard preparedness planning management. Um, I think those are the things that I really would love to see change because I think we always have really great intentions, but so far if I look back to other um, emergency situations that we've had, um, it didn't unfortunately lead be to better practice the next time around. And so, how can we take what we have built during this crisis, during this pandemic, in terms of relationships, in terms of collaborations, and how can we work together to integrate it into frameworks and practice? That's really what I would love to see change. So that we kind of, I think earlier in the box, somebody talked about universal design, you know, let's take a whole kind of like universal design approach to all of this and make sure that it includes all groups. Um, I think, so that is one of the components. I think the other components, and I think that goes really well with what Aaron is doing in terms of empowering people with disabilities to be their own advocates and to prepare you know, for themselves and to, to be prepared so that they don't depend on a system that may or may not have thought about all of their needs, right? Um, so how can I, as a person with a disability, how can I, as a family member, make sure that I don't depend on others coming to rescue me from my house? So um, I think those are the things in terms of what would I like to see change. Um, in terms of what COVID has um, kind of like, how COVID has impacted our work and maybe has had to do something a little bit different than we originally thought about. Um, and, and this is why I have this slide up here. Um, we had actually just talked, uh, we had actually just wor uh, started working on an emergency preparedness uh, project um, before COVID hit. And one of the components of our project was to bring together emergency responders, emergency planners and managers with people with disabilities. And we had planned like two events so that they kind of like could get to know each other, talk with each other, learn from each other, hear about these are our needs, those are our needs, and, um, you know, kind of have this conversation. Um, COVID came and obviously those um, in-person meetings were all canceled. And so we had to think about like, what, what can we do now? And so what we did instead is um, something that I think, you know, we now can use um, long-term because it's not a one-time kind of thing. We collected um, feedback from all of emergency personnel on 
what do you feel like you still need to know or you need to learn or what are the questions that you would have for people with disabilities? And we collected all of the information that they shared with us. And we did the same with individuals with disabilities and family members in terms of like, okay, so if you think about like your needs in an emergency, in a crisis situation, what questions do you have or what what do you need or what do you know do do you want to know and we took those kind of like answers and questions and created a little uh or we are still in the process of actually finalizing these two beyond um cartoon videos that will be available um on youtube to any and everybody and we will obviously also promote them to our emergency partners um that kind of took the, the information and put it into a little um, kind of like cartoon that people can watch that is fun to watch and engaging. And hopefully we also hit kind of like our diversity um, kind of um, components as well in that video. And we are answering those questions. So we are answering those questions for people with disabilities and their families, as well as for emergency planners, responders, um, managers. Um, so we, we kind of use that um, as a substitute for our two time kind of like events. Um, and I think that just gets me to the last thing that I think we sometimes forget um, and it's so important is that all emergency response planning um, is local. So you really, as a person with a disability or as a family member of a person with a disabilities, go and find your people, go and introduce yourself and make sure that they know you and you know them because if they have a personal relationship with you they will not forget about you because they know that you john are there and you will need their help or you know um i, I think we sometimes forget that and everything that's local means in somewhat is somewhat in our control because we can establish those partnerships or those relationships. And, you know, I'm just sharing kind of a personal story. Um, just as Laura had an emergency just now, last week, uh, my son had his first seizure. Um, we've never had one and I had to call um, EMTs and, uh, you know, we had never dealt with any of this. And um, the, the positive thing about this is that now we know some of the guys from the fire and EMT station and you know we we have this established relationship with them and I mean I wish I would have had this beforehand but I'm glad I got the opportunity um, you know uh, to, to establish that now so um, think think in those ways too i think sometimes we have the tendency to think abstract or um, on a framework level or on a higher level um, and some of the things we can do ourselves on a very local individualized level and i think with that i will push it back to you adrian thank you so much elka and appreciate you sharing your your story as well i think that's really important for us to keep in mind, you know, that it's, it's an emergency, things happen, and you, you, you never, never know. So thank you for that. Um, next, I would like to use the moderator prerogative here and uh, move up to uh, Justice to share remarks, because I know that you had um, to jump off a little bit early, and I just want to make sure that you have, I'm going to flip back to uh, the general slide here, I just want to make sure that you have time to reflect with us on these key questions for the panel around, you know, what do we want to see changed? What do we want to be different? And how can we be creative and problem solving to address these challenges? So uh, Justice, would love to turn it over to you. Hey there, everyone. This is Justice. Yeah, so I um actually going to do something a little bit differently here. I want to start off by acknowledging um, some of the people on the call who do this type of work. I'm not going to acknowledge by name, but just acknowledge by way of experience and some of the things that you have to contend with on a day to day basis to do the work that you do, whether it be specific to emergencies or public health or education um, or it, and with regards to how you show up in a space in terms of the, 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 the multiple roles and responsibilities that you have and how um, some sometimes it can be so difficult for us to, to understand um, and accept that we can't do everything, right? That, that, and then that can really be difficult because there is just so much to be done. 
um, I think about that in terms of concurrent crises is we want to, you know, jump in and, and do the best that we can. But I also want in terms of things that, you know, change, I want us to understand the importance of sustainability. And I think Ilko was talking about this before, right? We don't want things to just sit in the plan. We don't want things to just happen one time. But this also is important with regards to how we can sustain ourselves to do this work long term, right? And so um, we know that the, the ramifications, the impact of these crises will uh, take years and years to deal with on top of still having to deal with sudden crises. That, that still emerge as we go, right? So I do this presentation where I talk about structural violence, slow onset emergencies, as well as sudden onset emergencies. And it's a whole thing that I won't spend a ton of time talking about now. But I just, I just wanted to emphasize and affirm that experience for many of the people on the call and acknowledge that it is sometimes okay. And actually, it's always okay for you to set boundaries for yourself. I was listening to a podcast recently because, again, listening to different things to help you open your mind and get a better sense of how you can not only have personal growth, but also professional growth was listening to a podcast and a wonderful woman who does facilitation in black liberation spaces black movement spaces said a quote around boundaries that i will never forget and she said that boundaries are the distance between loving you and loving me simultaneously so effectively what that means is is the distance between loving your communities loving the work that you do and i'm talking about this in terms of this context because she was mentioning this in terms of personal and, and movement work but i will mention this in terms of of, of the context that, that we're in here in this space and how it can be applied but the distance between loving the work that you do, loving the, the, the people that you are here to serve or work with and connect with, the distance between loving them and loving yourself too. So you are also worthy of, of time and space. That love can be exemplified in a number of ways. It can be exemplified in you showing up to meetings multiple times a week or once or twice a week. It can show up in ways such as you, you know, physically being out there to do the work or you getting the work done from your bedroom or from your living room because that's the, the the bulk of your capacity for that moment, right? And that's also taught very clearly in disability justice. So I just wanted to acknowledge that because I don't think it's said enough in spaces like this. We just flippantly hear people say, take care of yourself, self-care. Um, but we don't talk about enough about what that means in terms of sustainability and burnout. So I wanted to um, just acknowledge that for a couple of the folks on the line. I'll mention a couple of other things here. Um, I love that Ilka mentioned that, you know, we want to focus on empowerment. And I also want to add to that, that we also want to put people with disabilities in power in power, in positions of power. And what that means is there's a wonderful guy named Rashad Robinson, who is the executive director of Color for Change. And he said, power, um, presence doesn't equal power. I'll say that one more time. Presence doesn't equal power. And when we talk about power, we mean the, the ability to change the rules, change the regulations, change how decisions are being made, right? So we don't want people with, just, with disabilities to just be casually consulted every now and again, and then everybody else goes in the back room and they make the final decision on what's happening. But does the public health team, leadership team in your, your state, is that inclusive of people with disabilities? And more specifically, is it inclusive of people with disabilities who actually want to use their experiences to inform the work that they're doing? because that is important. Not everybody with a disability wants to have that inform their work, right? Not everybody who's Black wants that to inform their work. And it's really important to think about that. I, I say this purely out of experience where people will say, well, we have, you know, four people with disabilities and yet their plans have no mention of disability. Right. So I just want that to be clear when we talk about putting people or, or appointing people or advocating for people with disabilities to be in positions of power. I also want to just acknowledge interdependence, which is also one of those uh, 10 disability justice principles. Um, I know so often in emergency management spaces, we talk about, you know, being able to save yourself and, and independently navigate and to individually uh, be able to solve problems and get out. But I also want to just affirm for the people who um, do not have the, the equipment or the services or the supports to make that possible and how interdependence is such a vital part of that survival mechanism for many people, right? And so I want to acknowledge that um, that's really, really important as we think through. So, and I, I say this because sometimes people will tell me, Justice, you know, they recommend a go bag that I don't have the money to fill. I barely can fill my own cabinets. I barely can fill my baby's stomach. And they're telling things to me about a go bag that I can't, I'm, I'm already rationing my medications. I don't have enough 
you know, money to, or I don't even have insurance, right? So there's, there's just a lot of barriers um, to people's experiences. And I just want us to be mindful of that as we're making recommendations for what people can do to prepare. I just want that to be a multifaceted process, right? That we're, we're, we're coming forth with multiple ideas and strategies and processes to meet people where they are, wherever they are, right? And that may be different from the mainstream experience. Um, so I just, I just want to kind of think about that a bit. Um, and then I, the last thing that I, I will say here is that I know there's this real push and, and, and expediency in terms of getting back to normal. <laughs> Let me just say that normal wasn't necessarily great for many people <laughs> beforehand, right? So getting back to normal, it's, I, I, I want us to, to get to a better place, right? I don't, I don't want us to necessarily just go back because there are people with disabilities who have been fighting for the very accommodations that have been made available during this pandemic. They've been fighting for those things for years and have been denied repeatedly. I'll give you an example in terms of work, right? So we, we tell people, you know, we give people these different ideas in terms of what to do to prepare. And then, you know, people may not have the monetary means to do that. So you're, you're talking about people working and some people um, are, are overqualified, underemployed, but who have been trying to get certain work accommodations for years and have been denied. The very same accommodations that are now being made widely available, right? The ability to work remotely. I'm working remotely as we speak, right? Um, uh, the, the ability to, to shift and flex your, your work hours, things of that nature. All of that is just really important. So we hope, or I hope that those accommodations continue um, throughout. And I also hope that people continue to, to um, collaborate in terms of the network um, work that's 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 being done, and I can specifically speak to NDRN. The way that that we were able to, and the network in general, the Protection and Advocacy Network was able to um, have such a rapid and robust response is because legal directors were talking to each other, CEOs were talking to each other. They were sharing uh, some of the, the 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 language that they were using to to get these complaints going. Um, no personally identifiable information, of course, but just sharing. Hey, I, we chose this strategy. We tried this method that seemed to work very really good in that state. We didn't even have to file a complaint because we said this and they immediately saw what we were planning to do and they, they got in, you know, they chose, chose to change the course of action and they recognized how uh, disastrous uh, of an impact this would have on people with disabilities. So there was the sharing of that information. Um, also, uh, certain strategies such as, you know, getting web pages up and, and having a, additional means of, of, of folks contacting and filtering in information to the PNA, right? So not just um, social media, that was really heavy, but then also having, you know, email addresses being posted because not everybody, you know, has the, the bandwidth to fill out very long, complicated forms or has the ability to call in and talk extensively um, for a, a full-blown intake process, but perhaps providing that information via email, a text number, um, but just additional ways for people to be in community and to be in conversation and to inquire about help and assistance. So I will mention all of those things and I will stop there. <laughs> I can go on for this for hours and quite literally I do when I'm doing presentations, but I'm forcing myself to stop. Um, I will say this, I do have to jump off in just a few moments here, but I will say if anybody has any additional questions, Adrian has my contact information be more than happy to continue the conversation adrian i'm not sure if you guys are tweeting or anything like that but if, if you guys want to continue the conversation that way but maybe some folks on the call who are social media buffs i am not but i try <laughs> i'm up on twitter at just a shorter one thanks so much everyone oh thank you justice that was great um and i just wanted to say a couple things that resonated with folks in the chat was your your comment around you know like normal what was that about you know and then, uh shout out to emily bridges she just had a, a awesome uh quote in the chat uh normal is a setting on a washing machine <laughs> and Absolutely. i don't think anybody wants to be that so it resonated Absolutely. with folks here thank you justice for being here and yeah whatever you need to head out uh we yeah, I'll get be it for a few more in case but, there's questions um, yeah then I'll, then thanks I'll just, I'll pop off. <laughs> linger as long as you can and thanks. thank you thank you thank you all right so um next i'd love to invite um aaron to the the virtual podium to talk through what you know what do we want to change and you know what are some thoughts around how it happens and um, how we might be creative in, in problem solving and addressing these challenges. Yes, definitely. Just like Justice said, I could probably talk about this forever. <laughs> so I'll try to keep it short. But so what do we want to change? Uh, some of the main things that pop up to me are just 
you know, more inclusion in that training exercise and response area, you can't, you can't really train exercise or respond to the whole community unless you invite the whole community to the table. So I think a lot of times in emergency management, emergency preparedness, public health, whatever government agency it is, or public agency, it really doesn't matter, uh, or private agency. I think a lot of times we try to think, okay, well, how do we hit the ADA guidelines here? Or how do we include this set of the population? And there's a bunch of people around the table you know, maybe discussing this very briefly on what they think, but you don't have an actual advocate there to say, this is what it's really like. You know, I, I could sit here and, and tell you what, uh, what being in a wheelchair is like and how hard it is to travel and to get into places and what the ADA guidelines say that, you know, setting up a shelter or stanchions, how much space you need. But actually talking to my friend who's in a wheelchair, she just blows my mind with all the things that I would have never thought of. And that's what we need at the table. And uh, I love the whole presence does not equal power. That, that's an amazing quote. I'll definitely be using that justice for a while. Just because we invite them to the table doesn't mean that that we're giving them the power to do anything. So what we need to do is not, not just invite them to the table, but put them in charge of these decisions. Give them that authority, give them a clear guidance of, okay, we want you not just to, you know, check a box saying we had you here and we included some of your ideas. We want you to work this issue with us. We want you to reach out to the community to help get this on board. And we, sh we really need to try hiring people to be in those positions of power so that they can sit there and say, okay, this is what we really need. Let's make it happen. Let's get a team together to make it happen. And that's obviously a lot easier to say than to do, but that's a huge area that I think we, we need to change. And we have to start at the baseline of, you know, asking those questions and getting people included into the table and start to give them those positions, start to give them that authority to make the changes to our emergency plan, make the changes to our exercise. And uh, uh, just from my own personal experience, I love training as real as possible. And they put me in, in charge of volunteer management for points of dispensing and uh, some emergency management you know, uh, mass casualty things. Well, I went to the Center of Disability Rights and said, hey, how many people can you give me to, to come and do these trainings? So we actually had people that had mobility issues. We actually had people that were deaf. So when the, the firefighters went over to, to people that were, were injured, you have somebody signing at them and they don't know what to do. And they're, you're putting them in that actual position. You can't just put a card that says, you are deaf, uh, act, act as if you don't know English. It's not the same. It's not the same to say, okay, put an, uh, another person into a wheelchair. No, it, it doesn't work. You have to go out to the community. They're there and honestly, you can make it really fun. And they really enjoyed being a part of that exercise. And honestly, it, it was it was a wake up call, I think, for a lot of people. And you can't be worried about looking bad because looking bad is the first step to figuring out where your gaps are so that you can start working on them. And as much as they were like, wow, the interpreter was really horrible that you guys had at this point of dispensing and uh, didn't really know Spanish too well. Or uh, we had feedback of this is really not an accessible point of dispensing, it was really difficult to get through. And, you know, you think that it's just a negative, but it's really not. If we're training and exercising realistically and including everybody in the community, we're going to learn a lot more and we're going to be able to actually make a difference so that when it comes to a real event, like a COVID vaccine dispensing, we're going to already know some of the tips that, that we didn't hit during some of our exercises so that we can actually help them in a time of need. 
also what do we want to change communication oh my goodness <laughs> communication is so huge I, i've tried to explain to some people that just really didn't get it how having a sign language interpreter on screen is so helpful being able to have closed captioning is so helpful and how sometimes closed captioning is really really not it's not saying the right message. So it, there's a difference between someone actually there being able to do the closed captioning or trying to just say, oh, this automated device is going to be good enough. You don't want good enough if it was you in, you know, in their same position. So we need to help people kind of understand. And that, that's all about being included. Um, for COVID-19 related, how do we get that education out to everyone? Uh, we're struggling with it in our county, just trying to figure out, okay, we put this education out there, but it's really only hitting a specific group of people. How do we get on TikTok, Instagram? You know, how do we formulate the message that it's, it's easier for some people to understand with obviously different education levels, different backgrounds? We have to put it out in different ways. Uh, one, one thing that I've been doing with a lot of people is I explain viral load as everybody has a cup and everyone has a different size cup that their body can take before they get sick. And I try to explain it saying, you know, when you're walking by somebody for two seconds that has COVID, it might be two drops into your cup. It's not going to overfill. It's not going to, uh, reach that capacity. When you sit down with somebody without a mask on, now it's like pouring water into that cup. Well, if I have, maybe I'm immunocompromised and I've got a little thimble, <laughs> I've got a little Dixie cup, and then somebody else sitting next to me has a big jug, gallon jug of water uh, that they can fill up. That's why I'm going to be at higher risk. I'm going to have my cup filled, uh, overflowed, uh, flowing first, whereas that person, he'll walk away from the conversation and never get COVID. And even just that quick breakdown of trying to help people understand it, it takes it out of a lot of the medical jargon that kind of goes over people's heads and it makes it like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And I think we need to do more like TikTok videos or little video clips. It's got to be funny. It's got to be something that can be lighthearted that people will want to watch and say, oh, that okay, now it's clicking, it's making sense. And uh, I, I think that's, that's something that we really need to work on. Uh, some of the creative problem solving things that we've done, we've obviously started training in that direct language, trying to get uh, a primary connection instead of going through an interpreter. We've used different mediums for technology, such as a Dropbox, different fillable forms, and Google Voice to be able to not only call people, but to text them as well. And uh, volunteers that had a disability, whether it's hearing, mobility, medical, we've had people that, uh, I had one guy that was volunteering and he's going through cancer treatments. And, but he wanted to help the community. And he said, there's no way I can come into the building to do a training. So we use technological solutions to be able to uh, get him hooked up with Google Voice, be able to help him train in a way that, that made sense for him. And we do have some contact, uh, contact tracers that are volunteers that they're hard of hearing, but we still want them to help. So they there are texters they sit there on google voice and they're just typing and texting every single person to try to give you know get in contact with people and they pass that information on to people that can call so there, there's a lot of ways out there and we just have to kind of figure out how can we think outside the box technology right now i think this is the we're poised for the best like explosion in using technology ever to meet our needs. And uh, I think most agencies that weren't receptive to technological advances in the past, mostly government, are now really adopting technological solutions, which starts to really include the community. And sorry for talking so long. I, I can go on for a while, but uh, that, that's what I have.
Oh, no worries, Erin. And thank you. That was, that was terrific. That's um, really helpful. And I, um, I may follow up with you to uh, flesh out that cup example. I think that is so helpful in terms of making it real for folks who, as you say, some of the techie medical jargon just is not going to resonate. But you can picture, do you have a thimble or do you have a gallon container for the exposure? So thank you, Erin. Appreciate you sharing with us. Um, next up, I would like to invite Scott to the virtual podium here to share your thoughts on what needs to change? How can we get creative and problem solving to address these challenges? Well, Aaron pretty much stole the thunder there. I mean, everything on, it's good that EMs kind of think alike on this thing. I, I, I feel so empowered to, to have like-minded people here. It's, it's just absolutely wonderful. Communication is the key and not just for COVID, but for anything. I think sometimes we limit the way we deliver messages out to the public. Uh, maybe using one, two, maybe three different methods, but it's got to be a multifaceted approach. I think Aaron kind of hit on this great. We need to use every tool in the toolbox. I mean, we have the, you know, the standard uh, flat head screwdriver, pair of pliers, and a hammer, but you know, that's only going to be good enough for some people, not for others. Um, in this particular event, we need to find out what's worked, and there's still a lot of people that we haven't reached. So we talked about earlier about widening that panel. What, how do we reach these particular folks? Well, I think there's several ways. Again, look at what we've used and try to see well, how are there, uh, what other mediums we might be able to get. Maybe it's through the associations, maybe through its chat groups, I'm not sure, but we really need to have a, a, a good look at that. Um, Ilka made some great points too. She was, uh, I've saw it standing up and jumping down because she, she knocked it out of the park as well. Uh, we really need to engage the community more. I mean, uh, we, we do a decent job, but it's, you know, even a good operation can always be improved upon. And we got to be honest. I've been in so many after actions where people just aren't honest with what's happened. Um, Aaron knows this. He's been in the EM and others that have been in emergency management know this more than any of us. People hate to say that we made a mistake, but it's okay. You know, <laughs> we don't want to bring people in because we don't want to expose that, hey, we don't know. But then we don't want to bring the people in that could give us the answers. It's like, it's just absolutely craziness here. Um, talking about building trust in that establishment, we've been able to do that with our long-term community, our long-term care facilities. And like I said, you know, our participation with them has almost doubled because they can trust us now. They know that we're there for their benefit. We're not there to report them or, you know, uh, highlight their particular mistakes. It's like, how is we as a group can get through this together. Your success is my success, your mistakes are my mistakes, et cetera, et cetera. We need to uh, you know, continue with our empowerment, but again, we need to broaden the way that we deliver those messages. I think Justice made some great points. There are a lot of people. I remember when I was in Dallas County, I would go to the, some of the poor sections of the, of the county. Uh, these people didn't have the money to put these things together. So what can we do? There's plenty of grant money out there. We just have to dig a little bit. Um, Elka also made a great point that we identify this. Remember, uh, one of my mentors used to say, had a joke about turkeys and eagles, and, and basically eagles taught the turkeys, you know, how to fly, and everybody thought it was great, and then everybody walked home. Well, that's exactly what we do here, is that we, you know, we talk about this thing, it sounds really great, but we never enact it. You know, we have to identify what the issue is, identify the solution, we can't waste time, put a date on there. Who's going to be responsible for it and document it, and make sure that everybody can follow up with it. If we do that, we'll be more progressive. In EM, we have the worst ability to either table it or put it onto a committee that sits there for a year and nothing ever happens until an event happens again and then we see the same issues repeating itself. So it's the definition of insanity. So I think there's a lot of good input. There's, I think there's a lot of things that we can do as a group out there. We just need to address them, be honest about it, and really try to find other ways. We've been really good about engaging some people, but there are still people out there that need to be brought into the fold. How do we do that? I don't know exactly. If somebody has some ideas, look, I have no ego, please give them to me. I will take whatever I can. That's all I got, Adrian. Oh, well, thanks, Scott. I appreciate that. And I just wanted to also reflect on a connection that I see between what you just said about being honest and what um, Justice said earlier around um, 
you know, like loving yourself, loving the community, being passionate about the work, but also like setting some positive boundaries. I think that being honest in the after action report <laughs> is important, but it's also important to be honest with yourself. And um, I think you really want to saying earlier, drinking from the fire hose, you know, like the information overload. That is an analogy that I have also um, used in other uh, presentations over the last few months. And you, you um, need to take care of yourself because these uh, issues and these emergencies are the, the emergency du jour, right? It's, it's what's going on right now. There's going to be other things and we need to be here <laughs> to address that and serve the communities we serve. So right on. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate you. All right, next I'd like to turn the virtual podium over to you, Vincent, to share your thoughts on what needs to change, thoughts on ways we can be creative in problem solving and addressing challenges. So thank you for allowing me to follow all these wonderful speakers. <laughs> it's not too much pressure. Um, you know, I, I just think these are just great ideas and just insights. Um, you know, I guess, um, you know, on my end, you know, what do we want to change? just to have more proactive engagement. You know, again, speaking from my end of the world, you know, I see a lot of these, um, you know, after the fact, uh, New York City Department of Health committees and hospital committees, now they want to get uh, the IDD input. They want to see what could we have done better, what should we do moving forward. And it's interesting because, you know, they'll invite the docs and the administrators and what have you, um, but I don't see any individual advocates. You know, I, I don't see anybody representing their own self, um, uh, you know, or being invited to the table. So I think uh, engagement is very important. Um, making sure that we improve community engagement. You know, when I talked about the DD coalitions here in New York State and how wonderful they are, they are wonderful. And I think some of the challenges um, are some of the community coalitions and connecting the two. So when I talk about the DD coalitions in New York State and New York City, they don't necessarily mesh well with the, the non-DD uh, coalition, be on Staten Island or New York, not because they don't mean well, what have you, but, but there's certain challenges. You know, for example, we talk about social determinants of health and food insecurity and what have you. Um, I was on a community coalition called uh, one of the boroughs and invited me to be part of it. So they talked about the food bank and, and offering you know, um, opportunities for families to get it. So one of my questions was, okay, so do all these places have curb cuts so we can get the wheelchair you know, over the corner? So they didn't know. Oh, okay. Well, it, are there any bus stops? What have you? You know, and it was almost kind of like, we'll get back to you. We'll get back to you. You know, and it's almost like it's not even patients with intellectual disabilities. What what about if somebody's in the VA? They you know they, they're in a wheelchair because of diabetic, what have you? You know. So I think it's just getting the communities to bring in the DD population. You know, now there's a lot of wonderful community um, efforts for group therapy, stress relief, what have you, um, for families to reach out. So when I say, well, I've got somebody, you know, a couple of individuals in a conference setting, they have what's called DSPs, or, or, or uh, this individual is at home with grandma, you know, she can't sleep for herself, but I think grandma would like to be there. Well, it's more of one-on-one. -on -one. But I think that engagement and getting uh, communities to involve the DD population in whatever activities and projects they have, um, not after the fact, but in the development process, I think that's really key. You know, here in, in New York City, they have, um, they're looking at hotels to accommodate the overflow of um, the hospitals or families that can't offer um, quarantine or, or isolation. Um, so when you look at the checklist for hoteling, there's like 20 or 30 criteria checklists that pretty much rule out almost anybody living in the concrete setting. So we were invited to the table after the fact. You know? So it's those things, it's being proactive about uh, getting more engaged, um, talking about what can we do. And I know Adrian and, and some other people on this call, you know, the, the, the high level education and, and training everybody and, and making everybody aware is all really wonderful and it's so important. Um, but when you kind of drill down, you know, here, here in New York City, uh, Health and Hospital Corporation has been great. Um, you know, they have free testing, drive throughs what have you, I think. But when you get down to it, you know, looking kind of some more at the details and how the high level impacts the ground level. For example, the testing, the nasal swabs has been a huge issue. Um, 
you know, my patients who have severe autism or family intellectually disabled behavioral disorders, I, I think two years ago or whenever prior to COVID, I, I would be hard pressed to try to get a nasal swab. So what training has that drive through, you know, technician had with that nasal swab? What, what, well, what happens if you can't get it? You know, and is it really adequate? Uh, you know, I, I struggle with that all the time, looking for information. Like, I get it. Everyone's got to be trained and, and understand and have you. But at the end of the day, that individual needs to have that nasal swab. What are we going to do? You know, now that we're talking about vaccines, you know, my concern is, you know, I'm fortunate. I work in a health center. I work at the Rose F. Kennedy Center. I'm surrounded by people that are caring, passionate, empathetic. So if we can't get a nasal swab, we'll try to desensitize, we'll, we'll calm them down, we'll, have, we'll give them lunch. We know how to take care of the individuals. I'm not worried about my individual. I'm worried about those individuals that see Dr. Smith down the road or, 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 or Dr. Jones over here who may not have the patients or the time that, you know what, they're not going to get the nasal swab, I'll just let it go. Now we talk about vaccines. I, I have a number of patients that are scared to death of the flu vaccine. They don't like needles, they don't like blood drawn, nothing. So on our end, we will do everything we can to de-escalate, desensitize, what have you. Um, I know that that's my comfort level. I'm just worried about everybody else. You know, the vaccines are going to come out. We have Moderna or Pfizer. That's great, wonderful. It's the importance of it. Who's going to train the actual phlebotomists, the physicians, to understand that somebody with autism is going to be scared to death of needles? So what do you do at that point? So, you know, I am being a little bit more detailed. I mean, not so much high high in the sky, but I think when we talk about education and systems and training, it has to go from top to bottom and really drill down um, to that one-on-one -on -one relationship on um, who's going to be giving the vaccines. At the end of the day, you know, if that doctor or that nurse can't give that vaccine to that individual uh, with Down syndrome or autism, with maybe a, a co-occurring condition of, of anxiety or bipolar disorder, you know, that, that individual has lost. So I, I think, you know, what do I want to change is is um, again proactive engagement, getting communities involved with our population, and collaborating across congregate settings, and whatever we do at a very high level, make sure that at the ground level, boots on the ground, it really makes a difference. Um, you know, um, so that's one thing. Um, how are you creative in problem solving and addressing challenges? I think, from an administrative standpoint, what was pretty impressive about our staff all over was how everybody stepped up. Um, you always hear it takes a village to do this, to do that, but it was amazing to me how many staff that were maybe in positions of maybe a, a front desk staff answering the phones or or or, register or nursing, what have you, um, but they had these amazing IT skills. They had these amazing teaching abilities. So we had people that were maybe, for example, in a call center in a cubicle um, taking phone calls eight hours a day, um, but they were just so incredibly IT savvy and they could train doctors on how to use um, telehealth. So I think uh, creative problems, we actually shifted some of the responsibilities with our staff in terms of what their expertise and comfort levels were and utilize them as best we can, especially in that uh, emergent uh, situation when COVID hit us. It took us probably about a week to actually turn over and start providing our first telehealth service. And right now, I can tell you right now, if it wasn't for some of these um, kind of back, not back room, but you know, staff that are more the cubicles, if they didn't step up, I would never have figured out how to use a Zoom, <laughs> how to link, nothing. So, so you know, I think that's how we're able to be creative and, and step up. And also, um, we so we were able to see the leadership in those people. So I think that was really impressive. Um, another thing that we also had to do, um, especially with the DD coalitions, you know, unfortunately a lot of these DD agencies don't have medical directors, chief medical officers. Um, they have nurses that are spread out so thin that are well-meaning. Um, uh, but these nurses are also looked at to be the be all end all, so they're overloaded. So what we did uh, during COVID was, um, for lack of a better term, we had uh, virtual town hall meetings. And we targeted those DD agencies that did not have a medical director, or maybe had a, uh, a nursing director that was overwhelmed and, and just stressed out and a little bit lost. So we had these town hall meetings at the larger DD agencies throughout New York City, and it was more 
was myself and a couple of other nurses and, and support staff. And it was just an hour, hour and a half of uh, questions and answers. Whatever we could, whatever we could glean from the CDC or DOH update at that point in time, we were able to kind of maybe filter it better so it wasn't so much information overload for this one poor nurse overseeing 10 different group homes in, in, in Brooklyn or in Staten Island. Um, so I think that's, I think that's uh, kind of the gist of uh, what we did. So. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, and I just want to encourage those of you who are attending in the audience, feel free to start using the chat to throw out your, your questions for the panelists. We're going to be getting there in just a minute. Um, just a couple of reflections from the hats that I wear and where I sit. In addition to being at AUCD, um, I also um, and volunteering this year as the chair of the um, American Public Health Association's um, Public Health Education and Health Promotion section. And a couple of the priorities that I have are around making a, um, making it a standard operating procedure to have accessible communication whenever we're sending out health education information. Um, and making sure that that's also culturally competent. Um, and I just wanted to mention that here as well, because I think it speaks to the issues of um, intersectionality that all of the panelists have brought up as well. I just think there's um, an identity challenge right now too, um, among public health practitioners uh, kind of feeling like, oh, well, this is the emergency manager's role. Am I really up to bat on this? And I, and I tell my colleagues, you're up. You're up to bat. It's, it's, you definitely feel free to use your tools and wear all the hats you wear. Get good information out there in ways that are accessible for everybody in the whole community. Um, so I just wanted to share that. And that goes back to the points around being open to collaborate and think about connecting with folks that you maybe didn't connect with, but you always coulda, woulda, shoulda. Now's the time to so hold that up as well and think about that. And then the other piece that I just wanted to reflect on before we turn it over to general Q&A from the audience um, is this issue around self-care, but more than self-care, being resilient. And I, I feel like that's sort of getting to be like a cliche word nowadays. Oh, be resilient and bounce back. And this is, this is hard work. And um, I just want to remind all of us here, because I know we all contribute in different ways, that um, it is good to take a break. It is good to honor yourself as a human being when you need to take a water break or just get outside, get some fresh air, get some sunlight. Those are good things. Take a few moments to do that throughout your day. Um, that is critical so that you are here to do your good work after COVID is over. It will be over at some point. Uh, but it, it's, it's um, something you just need to do to take care of yourself and set those limits, set those boundaries so that you can uh, be here for the next time. So with that said, let me see what questions uh, the, the audience may have for us. Uh, feel free to either use the chat. I see a couple folks have just chimed in with comments here. Um, and uh, if, if there's any questions, you know, that this is your time now to ask of the, uh, the panelists. And you can either use the chat box or you do have the ability to take yourself off mute. Use your power wisely. If, if you're in a busy, noisy place, you don't need to take yourself off mute. But if you would like to, you certainly can. And I see, let's see here. Um, looking at the chat. Yeah, there's a quite a few folks who are saying that they liked the ideas that were shared around communication and that they may borrow some of them for other testing sites um, that they're facilitating. And also, um, Linda Starnes mentioned here, thinking about the 
other support um, folks might need for communication services like augmentative and assistive technology. Good point. Good point, Linda. Just checking out the chat, see if there's any other questions here. All right, and then Sue Fordham wrote in that she's worked with a lot of local public health and emergency management departments that don't get along. Ah, yes, this is local government conflict. Yes. Any suggestions for getting EM and PH together with each other? I think that has Scott and Aaron's names written all over it, not to call you all out, but to call you all out. <laughs> Well, I can tell you that, uh, so when I was with Dallas County Emergency Management, um, our, our county uh, public health partners, there was a, a rough patch there. And I think what the issue was is that they always thought that EM was infringing into their particular areas and thought we were getting out of our way. Um, the way we were able to address that is you know, through different trainings and exercises and letting them know that you know, EM is, is not the lead in anything. We're, we're support. Okay, emergency management is support and coordination. And we were able to, to, to use those particular trainings and exercise to show them that, that, hey, no, we're not here to take the lead or even tell you what to do. You utilize us when you need some uh, particular re support resources or some help getting some coordination from other parts of the government. Um, it took a little bit of time. I mean, you know, it's not just with county health and, and county EM or even local health or local EM could be with the fire department. Um, I can't tell you how many people think that when you do exercises that, you know, basically EM is trying to show them up or show that they don't know how, what, you know, basically what they're doing or they don't have a good plan. And we were able to address that because again, we just went with, hey, your success is our success. Your failure is our failure. And again, uh, we're here to support you. You tell us what you need. Uh, and you know, after, I would, it took six months. But after about six months, I don't think, you know, we weren't going out and having drinks together, but uh, there was a healthy work relationship. And to kind of uh, talk about <laughs> off of what Scott just said, man, I, I wish you were uh, running our EM. <laughs> I think, yeah, there, there's always been this conflict. It's not just, you know, public health and emergency management. It's there's relationship conflicts with almost any department and even in your own department that, that you're going to hit. And I think building those relationships before any sort of emergency is huge. All the people that we had great relationships with through exercises or developing different uh, criteria and plans throughout the years, those are the ones that are really coming through for us, honestly, because we've already worked with them. They know how we work. They, they, we don't have any issues going on. So that's, that's always been like a good relationship thing. Uh, with emergencies, sometimes you can kind of break through some of those barriers because guess what? You're all getting, you're, you're all getting no sleep. You're all, you know, going through the same thing together. And I think, it's almost a make or break a relationship. So you kind of got to be careful because I've already seen throughout COVID when we're all, you know, a little agitated working 80, 90, a hundred hours a week. And uh, mostly during March and April where some people were just at each other's throats, but then other times we're just kind of laughing at midnight going, what the heck are we doing? Or, you know, we're just all so tired and you start to create bonds that, that would have never been there if it wasn't for this emergency. As far as, you know, emergency management, we're lucky to have a few good relationships there. Uh, but as Scott was saying, like them supporting us, that that's definitely the main role. They're, EMs are not really supposed to just take control of everything and run the whole operation. Whereas, you know, people are definitely kind of afraid of that. In this situation, I think some of us would be like, please, please run something, you know, uh, our, our emergency management was a little bit more on the side of it's the public public health crisis. So let them handle it. They're the, it wasn't just the, you're the lead, but, uh, you're the lead and we're not in it at all. <laughs> and that's, that's not helpful either. So we've, we've been trying to work with them a lot and they have started to step up 
and in certain areas. I think a lot of it was they don't understand how much we're doing. They, if we're not talking with them, if we're not uh, really showing them how, how busy our lives are and what we really need and where we're failing, they, they honestly, they'll just end their day at four o'clock and, you know, go about their way because we don't actually share like an office or a building with them. So I think we've started to uh, just ask them to, hey, can you, can you be a part of this? I just want you to come in on this meeting. And we didn't really need them on some of these meetings. It was more or less just to give them an awareness. I started sending out our situation reports to them and you know, I'm not filtering these reports. I'm, I'm saying we're struggling here. We're 300 cases behind. We're getting further behind each day. We hired 15 new people, but we're still, we still need 30 more employees and we can't seem to catch up. Like just being honest. And it kind of goes back to when you're training and exercising those after action reports, don't pull your punches because it's never going to help anybody to sit there and say, Oh, we're doing great. We're doing great. You know, it, no, guess what? We're all struggling and it's not going perfectly. And n nobody can expect you to just take an extra hundred positive cases a day and you're hitting a thousand cases a day or something. We were never set up for that. Nobody was. So how, helping to bring other people in and understand that we're doing as much as we can and we're drowning. And then they start to see that and they realize, okay, well, how can, now they're kind of more willing, oh, how can we help? The, at first they were kind of thinking that we were just trying to dump work onto them instead of we cannot, uh, we cannot handle this. It's getting dropped. We're not trying to drop work on you. We're trying to just stay above water. So I think bringing them in was, was huge and just telling them what our situation was on a day-to-day -day basis. They could see how we're trying to, you know, meet those gaps. And then I think it also is good to obviously acknowledge them when, when they, for us, they set up a, a call center because we were, our average wait time hit over two hours just to get a person on the phone through our call center because we were having a couple thousand calls a day. So they actually set up a, a little call center at their public safety training facility and they reduced our wait time down to about 20, 30 minutes. And in the next situation reports, I was just like praising them for that. And, you know, people were actually able to, to have a night to see their family for once and instead of trying to take calls till nine or 10. And that, that I think really helped the relationship and help them understand that they're super appreciated and we need their help to support this mission. We can't do it on our own. So uh, I think, again, kind of to that, that point, yes, there's a lot of conflicts in, in any department. And I think just really trying to include them, uh, give, give them the no nonsense where we're at. We're not trying to dump work on you, but we honestly just need your help. Can you help us out? We'll get your back if you get our back, you know, we're going to help you out as well if you ever need it. So that, that's my, my two cents on that subject. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Aaron. Any other questions from the group? I mean, I have, I, I have another one generally for the, the panelists overall, um, and it relates to trust. Uh, right now, it is uh, still information overload for many. And how do you deal with some of the public's mistrust for information that you are um, giving? And, and what are some workarounds, thoughts or strategies on that? Well, I can tell you how we deal with it. Uh, it Communicate, I mean, we, we keep saying communication, but communication is so key. We've always talked about making sure we provide good information quickly. Sometimes we're not the best at doing that. Uh, and then if we provide a particular message out that's wrong, we really don't like to, to admit we made a mistake. It's okay to admit you made a mistake. That's where the trust's gonna be. But I think being able to provide consistent 
and reliable information. We've got all these programs in emergency management, joint information centers that hardly ever get used. We, don't, we are the worst at following our own practices. Sometimes we've got these plans in place and then we shoot from the hip <laughs> when the real deal hits. So I, I don't get it. But I think, you know, if you're consistent with the information you're providing them and uh, admitting, hey, sometimes you just don't know, uh, there is a lot of conflicting information out there. So just being consistent and providing constant information. And if you don't know, providing resources that are out there. Uh, you know, we try to load our page up with everything from mortgage assistance, uh, cons this, this particular disaster has caused so many things besides the illness. Uh, people have been unemployed, uh, they don't have enough money for rent, or food, or what have you, and be able to anticipate those particular needs ahead of time and providing that information, again, in multiple places that they can get to it, I think helps establish that, hey, when times are tough, that they're gonna rely on the government. Because if we look like we don't know what we're doing, we're in trouble, right? Because they rely, they're hoping that the local government knows and if we don't look like we know, then you know, the trust is going to be completely lost. I think the other piece, Adrian, this is Ilka. Um, I appreciate what Scott said. I think this is where really those relationships, I mean, if we talk specifically about um, disasters and people with disabilities, this is where we would hope to have those relationships with emergency management, with public health, um, with our local um, you know, um, um, responders give us the information because sometimes what we experience is there are certain groups that really don't trust the government at all and it doesn't matter who you are and what you do um it is just a general mistrust that they are just gonna you know pull one over on us or they want to give us like some stuff that's like poison for our body or whatever it is um i mean there's lots of that stuff out there too and um I think we try to then channel it also to our trusted partners. So maybe we have a specific group of African-American um, families that have kids with autism who really, they need to hear certain information through their trusted, um, you know, community health worker who can then make a difference or, you know, through the other moms who are like, hey, it's a good thing to get, you know, vaccinated or, you know, um, whatever it is. Um, so I think making use of relationships with people who can get that information out in a way that people trust it or that people can understand it. I mean, sometimes you have information that really we, we need to adjust and make more accessible because it isn't accessible. And so I think those partnerships, I think, would be really appreciated by the Centers for Independent Living. I think they are great partners in something like that, or the USEDs or other disability organizations to get that information out um, and to communicate that. So here in New York, maybe it's a question for Aaron, so, uh, or, or, or Scott, so do you connect with the Development for Disability Agency? So here it's called, they're called OPWDD, Office for People with Development Disabilities. So, um, you know, I, what I find here is that families will come to, to us to ask questions about healthcare, obviously, you know, and when we're trying to give information, not only to patients, families, group homes, you know, staff, what have you, obviously we'll cite the resource. Um, so based on the DOH website, CDC website, so on and so forth. What I've seen here in New York State is that they'll go to the OPWD website and the OPWD website will say, refer to DOH. So I, I guess, I mean, Aaron, um, so I'm learning a lot myself. So, you know, with emergency management and public health, and that's why I was always doing this up to public health and health and hospital corporations, what have you, you know, because um, there's really no drama here in New York City whatsoever. Um, but I was just wondering, yeah, so do you communicate with state TV agencies to have one um, location? Because here in New York, the OPWD has a great website, but so does DOH, so does Office for Mental Health. Yes, yeah, we, we definitely communicate with those groups a lot and uh, it's all about transparency. We're with the public, you know, there's going to be certain questions like, are these going to be tracking devices in, in these injections? No, we're, we're not even going to address those like kind of ridiculous questions, but uh, I'm, I'm lucky our uh, Dr. Mendoza is uh, our commissioner of public health and he's 100% just all about being completely transparent whenever he does a briefing. He has us, you know, even kind of asking volunteers to do like a rumor mill thing. And if we hear certain rumors that keep kind of getting speed and uh, it's something that needs to be addressed, 
he puts it out. Uh, we have uh, kind of to Scott's case. We've had certain things where we messed up the numbers on one thing or, or this is why there's a difference in New York state numbers versus the county numbers or the regional numbers. And Mendoza will just put it out there and say, you know, there was an error on, on the reporting for last, uh, yesterday or last week and this is why it happened this is how we corrected it and this is the reason behind it and you will get so many people pissed off about that uh but it doesn't matter because people are seeing that if you're willing to make those those uh kind of it, it's an uncomfortable situation to say yeah we screwed this up and here's the real information on it but I think people then can trust your information more as you go forward. Cause they're like, well, if it was, if they didn't know, they'd say it. And, you know, Dr. Mendoza has said that multiple times where he's saying, we don't know this, this right yet. We're working on it. We're trying to see the correlation, but we just don't see it right now. Uh, we have, we, since April, March or April, we had biweekly meetings with all the colleges and schools uh, long-term care groups and coalitions that we try to meet and try to figure out different cases and different scenarios. So it, it's a lot about not just putting out the widespread media stuff, but also saying, okay, OPWDD, this is what, what we just got passed down from, you know, CDC is saying this, New York State DOH is saying this, this is our take on on a, in a clinical standpoint. What are you guys facing? How can we help? What do you need from us? And we just keep those channels open. And sometimes the meeting might be quick and saying, yep, nothing's changed. Everybody's busy. Have a nice day. Uh, but then sometimes they bring up really important, you know, discussion topics. And then we take it back to our team, try to figure out what our stance is on it and what the clinic clinicians say and then go back to them and it's all about following through and following up it's a lot and uh like i said before our our hotline had over a two-hour wait at one point but that's also because we weren't dropping calls we weren't sitting there going okay well these ones are really ridiculous questions and we're not going to answer them everyone will eventually get a call back uh even if it's two days later they will get an answer to their question and we will have somebody that researches it, tries to find the reference to, is it on OPWDD's website? Is it on New York State's website? How can I, you know, take a picture of that, email it to the person or get them on the phone and stay on the phone with them to guide them to that resource? Our calls sometimes take longer because of that, but uh, we're feeling for the people that are kind of getting passed around where they call, you know, they call five different places and they get the runaround and we don't want that. So we're trying to do that runaround for them, find the information and then connect them to the direct source. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. And, and there's a lot of resources out there. Don't just sit there and try to re reinvent the wheel. If there's uh, an issue at nursing home guidance, we're going to talk to that community. We're going to talk to OPWDD. We're, we have to go to those subject matter experts because they're going to know a lot more than we're going to know uh, on that subject. Aaron, you're so right. You know, when you talked about the follow through, I remember at Dallas County, we were one of the agencies I was trying to engage was a deaf action uh, committee. And uh, it was hard. A lot of the disability groups just didn't trust county government. They've been over promised and always under delivered and uh, it impacts. You, you talk about having to really jump some hurdles to, to establish that trust. That, that follow through is absolutely key. Great, great, great piece. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh, Aaron, did you wanna add anything else? Yeah, uh, well, one thing that we did notice in a lot of our underserved communities, they, they didn't like the direction from or a testing site that were, you know, people that were white or people, you know, from males or something like that. So we worked with like the Black Nurses Association. We've, we've worked on, you know, trying to figure out if you're not trusting this group, how, how can we 
provide you either information or a liaison that you do trust. And we've kind of uh, reached out to some like kind of community leaders even and said, okay, well, can we kind of talk with you? And then you relay that message. And if you have concerns from your community or group, then you come to us with those and we'll sit down and try to hash those out and figure out how we can overcome that. It's, it's again, a lot of time, but it's uh, trying to reach those populations and figure out, well, why aren't you, why don't you trust the system? And you find out that some of these groups that uh, are maybe from different nations, some of them are, a lot of them actually we were dealing with were refugees and they saw that their government before really didn't help them out and hurt them. And, and some people, when they went to medical facilities, they never came out. So they were just really terrified that this is going to be a repeat of that. So trying to understand that cultural aspect, getting and getting the buy-in from the community leader or that uh, religious leader really helped us to kind of make a breakthrough in those communities that were actually clusters that really started to spread COVID a lot because they wouldn't go, they wouldn't self-identify, they were traveling, they were carpooling, uh, they didn't wear masks when they took breaks, like all of this stuff, and they wouldn't listen to our guidance, but when we broke through to their leadership, then they listened to that leadership and really uh, started listening, which was great. Thank you all. Thanks for that wrap up, Erin. And thank you um, for everyone's active participation today. Uh, we are at time, so I'm going to wrap us up. I think those last pieces around building understanding and, and trust are, are really critical to support our ongoing work, for sure. Um, want to just let you know that um, we always want to stay connected with you really just to hold each other up in this work and let you know you're not alone uh, there are two different ways that we can keep in touch beyond the AUCD conference all year round. One is through our health and disability special interest group. Uh, we specifically focus on health promotion areas around healthcare transition. Um, and so I have the link there. You'll also get copies of, of these slides as well. So you don't have to frantically write that down. We will share that with you. The other group that I would invite you to join if you're not already part of it is our emergency preparedness special interest group. Um, that is a great way to stay in touch with each other again throughout the year. Thank you all so very much for your time and attention. Hope to see you at other pre-conferences and during the main AUCD conference. Uh, best and be well. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you all and thank you to our panelists. Hey, Laura, are you all right? Yes. <laughs> did, did things calm down? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. So right before, before, I mean, it was like uh, 15 minutes before. So right when, when